Hello and thank you for staying tuned to Health Matters on Channels Television. I am Mary Alale Yusuf. The global case count for COVID-19 is over 166 million. And as at Friday, May the 21st, the death toll was over 3.4 million. In Nigeria, there were over 165,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19, more than 156,000 recoveries, and 2,067 deaths. There were a total of 283 new infections, 63 recoveries, and one death between May the 14th and May the 21st. Recovery rate is about 94.3%. Case fatality is about 1.25%. And finally, over 2 million samples have been tested. More than 1.9 million vaccines covering 95% of the target population have been administered. Some states have started giving second doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And those are your figures. But the topic for today is hypertension, which is also elevated blood pressure and is a serious medical condition that just isn't getting enough attention because many who have it don't know. According to the World Health Organization, about 1.13 billion people worldwide have this condition. In 2015, it was one in four men and one in five women. My guest is the chief consultant family physician at the National Hospital Abuja and the president of the Society of Lifestyle Medicine of Nigeria. She joins us from our Abuja studio. Well, you're welcome to the show, Dr. Ifoma Monye. Great to see you. Okay, Thank let's... you so much, Mary, for having me. Thank you. You're welcome. We, let's start off with, you know, your, almost everybody I know has had a day or two, maybe separated, not together, of elevated blood pressure, heart pounding experiences that raise the blood pressure, but they are not said to have blood, high blood pressure. So what are the criteria for... Uh, telling your patient you have hypertension? Okay. So, um, as you have correctly said, um, high blood pressure or sustained high blood pressure, uh, which we know as hypertension, is a very serious condition. Uh, it is a condition that people should not take um, lightly at all. And quite often, it does not have symptoms. However, if you do your blood pressure, check it by uh, a medical person, a clinical person, a nurse, a pharmacist, uh, or your doctor, in fact, and it is found to be elevated on two separate uh, times, not just the one-off, uh, then your doctor will advise that you have hypertension. And what we, what we say it's elevated, you know, normally when we do blood pressures, we do two values. The upper one is a systolic value, the lower one is diastolic value. The upper one, which is a systolic value, tells you uh, what, ha what is happening to your blood vessels when your heart is contracting and pumping blood into your body. And that's your systolic, when the heart is contracting and squeezing blood into your body. When your heart is relaxing, uh, in between beats, that is the diastolic. So when the upper one and the lower one are more than 120 over 80, we say that your blood pressure is elevated. However, when it remains sustained, elevated above 140 over 90, then we say you have hypertension. So that, and, and you, as, you can, as you've heard us say, there many, many times there is no symptom to tell you that. The only way to know is to have your blood pressure checked accurately. Um, let, and this me, year, hypertension, World Hypertension Day has actually uh, said that we must measure our blood pressure accurately, control it, so that we can live longer. Let me quickly ask you, uh, this elevated blood pressure, can somebody have elevated blood pressure for a sustained period of time due to a traumatic event and not be hypertensive. Maybe he's had, you know, a car accident, you know, loss of a loved one, and the blood pressure is elevated for, say, a week. Does that classify as high blood pressure or hypertension? 
Well, that's a very good question. Uh, and I'm going to answer it in a way that it will help everyone listening. We ought to understand that uh, one of the causes of uh, hypertension is stress, too much stress. And the situation you have just mentioned is a very stressful situation. And quite often, people get diagnosed with hypertension following a stressful situation. So that sustained high blood pressure a week after um, the loss of a loved one or a car accident or a major traumatic event in your life may just be, may just be the warning sign that hypertension is happening. So do not say, oh, it's because I lost a loved one. Oh, it's because I, 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 I was boggled. Oh, it's because I had this stressful situation. No, that stressful situations can bring on hypertension, can cause you to develop hypertension. And so that blood pressure that, has, that stays elevated after one week must be reviewed uh, constantly until it is seen to be coming down or it is seen to have settled. Otherwise, you will need some more advice on managing that uh, blood pressure. Most people agree that there's no particular cause for hypertension, but that there are uh, risk factors. W what are some of these risk factors that are generally agreed to be, you know, uh, uh, those of hypertension? Okay, very good question again. The risk factors can be either modifiable risk factors or non-modifiable risk factors. And the vast majority of hypertension that we have is due to the modifiable risk factors, which makes it the good news, even though it's a very serious illness. Uh, but we find that the modifiable risk factors are, are things that we can modify, we can do something about. So if we start with those that are not modifiable, there are just a few. Uh, your age, uh, the older you get, the more you're, you're likely you're going to develop hypertension. After the age of 65, we, we usually say, um, your, your gender, so if you're a man, you are more likely to have it. If you have a family history of hypertension, you're more likely to have it. But what about the modifiable factors? They are the lifestyle factors. And that is the good news because you can do something about your lifestyle. And the modifiable factors are things like having too much alcohol, too much salt, too much stress, too much trans fat or saturated fat in your meal, so what you eat, or too little sleep too little joy and relaxation, too little physical activity. So these are modifiable risk factors. Then of course there are other situations uh, that can also uh, predispose to um, uh, hypertension. Um, if you have diseases such as adrenal tumors or diseases uh, of the thyroid, you can have that. You can also have hypertension in children, you know, uh, where a child has got a congenital uh, problem such as coarctation of the aorta or renal artery stenosis. Or sometimes also you can be at risk of having hypertension if you're taking some medications. Uh, so certain kind of medications can actually predispose you to that. And if you are on those medications, you do need to have your blood pressure checked quite regularly. And these medications are medications such as uh, the birth control pills, you need to be sure that you're checking your uh, blood pressure if you're on these pills. Uh, and there are some kind of pills that are cannot, can actually elevate your blood pressure. And um, if you have blood pressure already as a problem, you shouldn't really be taking those. And that's medications like the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs like um, uh, ibuprofen or naproxen, which many people just buy off the counter and take. Be careful, your blood pressure may just be uh, a, 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 in jeopardy if you're taking medications that can raise uh, your blood pressure. So these are some of the risk factors. Um, so modifiable and non-modifiable. And you know, I say again, the great news is that the modifiable ones uh, are the, the vast majority, the causes of hypertension, and we can do something about that to prevent hypertension from even starting or treat it if it is there and actually put it in total remission and reverse it so that you are not hypertensive anymore if you alter if you uh, change these lifestyle practices, like I have mentioned, in your nutrition, uh, your physical activity, your sleep, the amount of rest you have and the way you manage stress, keeping away from alcohol, not smoking at all, and of course, having loving, supportive relationships. Oh, I like the loving, supportive relationships. Well, let's look at some other modifiable factor here. You mentioned birth control pills. Does that extend to other hormonal birth control, like the injectables and the um, 
the uh, subdermal um, contraceptive, those ones they put under the arm, are, are those also implicated in, in causing or triggering of high blood pressure? So it's usually the ones that combined oral contraceptive pills. Uh, so those that have estrogen as well as, 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 well as progesterone. Uh, so, that, so those are the ones who are particularly keen to make sure you measure your blood pressure. Um, however, um, one of the things that the WHO wants us to do uh, with the clinicians, and I think that patients need to know this as well, uh, is that WHO and United Nations want to bring down the prevalence of, of hypertension uh, by the year 2025 by 25%. And one of the big easy ways to do this is to actually make a diagnosis of hypertension. So at every clinical encounter, whether or not you're on the pill, whether or not you're on the uh, subdermal, uh, progesterone only one, please get your blood pressure checked. Because like I said, many, many times there is no symptom. And it's the only way you know you even have it is if you have it checked ever so regularly. So if you're at risk at all, either by family history or by any of the things I've mentioned, then please make sure you check your blood pressure at every clinical encounter. So that's one. Uh, one way that we will actually catch the hypertension and then do something about it. Another way also is to make sure that we have you know, high capacity community checks, community uh, programs where people are gathered together, be it in your neighborhood, be it in your churches, be it in mosques, everywhere, asking people to just come and have your blood pressure checked. Um, it's free, it's, it doesn't cost pain when you do it, but it will save a whole lot of heartache and it will save a whole lot of sequelae because there are complications that happen if you do not do something about your blood pressure. Uh, your organs uh, get targeted and can get uh, uh, into trouble if you are not controlling your blood pressure, even though you don't feel anything, you know. So the eyes uh, can get into trouble. The back of the eye, where we call the retina, can actually, um, uh, the arteries or the vessels there, because what is blood pressure? Blood pressure is that the force that our arteries, our blood vessels feel when the heart squeezes and pumps off blood uh, to, to supply all, all, all cells in the body. And the force with which it does so is the pressure. And when this pressure is high, in the blood vessels, regardless of what part of the body it is, then what we have is high blood pressure if it's sustained. So the eyes will suffer and you can actually get blind. Uh, but it starts with being blurred, the vision gets blurred, and then blindness follows if nothing uh, is done about it. And the rest of your body can suffer. Every organ, the heart can suffer. You can have heart attacks from hypertension or sustained blood pressure. Uh, the kidney can suffer. You can have chronic kidney disease from sustained blood pressure that you haven't done anything about, and so on and so forth. So really, really, really that we can't say it enough, we need to check our blood pressure, we need to check it accurately. There is an accurate way of checking blood pressure. Uh, and if it is seen to be high, we need to do something about it. Either by using a um, lifestyle approach with the food you eat, the physical activity, the sleep, and so on, or occasionally you may need to take medications, especially if you have an underlying condition before the hypertension happens, like an underlying heart condition or like diabetes, you may need to start with tablets. But the truth is, non-pharmaceutical ways are the first approach uh, that has been advised to manage hypertension. And let, it's, let it's, me it's, quickly it talk happens. about... It's, it, the, let me quickly talk about one of the lifestyle issues. Now, even amongst you physicians, there's been some sort of disagreement about fat, the place of fat, whether it's dangerous or beneficial. Can you clear that up for us? Let's quickly, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll go to that question. Please stay with us. We're taking a short break. Welcome back. We're talking about hypertension, on Health Matters on Channels Television, a serious condition which many people who have it don't even know. The number to call if you have any questions for hypertension is 0805-468-3514. It should be showing on your screen now. You can also tweet at CTV underscore Mary A. Dr. Monye, welcome back. We were talking about the fat controversy. Could you get into that for us? Thank you very much. Um, again, a very, very important uh, question. 
Um, the reason is that people are often confused about fat and hypertension or heart conditions. Um, I don't think there is a, a lot of conf uh, confusion there. It's quite straightforward. What we know at this time, uh, re there is a clear evidence um, uh, that fat, there is good fat and there is bad fat. You need good fat to keep your brain working well. Uh, you need good fat that actually protects your heart. So the good fat or the HDL cholesterol, high density lipoprotein cholesterol, they are sources of fat that we actually need to be high in our body. And we will find such kinds of fat uh, in mostly plant uh, sources of fat, you know, like nuts. Uh, and a lot of nuts uh, would, 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 you know, compete for attention here. Uh, so, you know, and seeds. So walnuts, uh, chia seeds, flax, flax seeds, these things are, are, are good uh, for the good kind of fat. Um, we also have oil, oils as well, like olive oil. And I'm going to touch a bit on our tropical kinds of oil, like coconut oil and palm oil. I know that that is what can cause some confusion. Now, the thing about coconut oil and palm oil... Before we go uh, into tropic oil, tropical oil, just yes. a moment. I know you're raring yes. to go, but we have somebody on the line. <laughs> Okorafo is on the line. Let, let us quickly take his question before we continue. Hello, Okorafo. Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon, my sister and the uncle. Good Doctor, afternoon. I want to find out from you this afternoon. People are saying salt, salt, that is not. Oh, it looks as if we lost now, the correct. of salt, what okay. is the grade or the quantity one can take? Because they said you don't need to take plenty of salt. When you go to a pharmacy, Great, so Korafo, I think we've got it. Doctor, can you quickly answer his question? How much salt yes. can we take? Yes. Yes, yes. So um, that's, again, a very good question about salt. Um, we know that black-skinned people do not uh, are, are salt sensitive. They do not handle salt. Their kidneys don't handle, handle salt very well. And so for us, we should really, really uh, make sure that we keep our salt intake down. And, and the advice for those of us who are black-skinned is not more than 1,500 milligrams of salt every day, okay? Um, does, so uh, that's when you're quite measuring. little. And, and the weight, yeah, I mean, how are you going to really measure it in the different foods you eat? So here, here, is the, here is the advice that we give. Here is the advice that we give. Number one, remember that it is not salt that makes food sweet. No. Uh, it's usually the herbs and the spices, okay? And there are herbs and spices that actually accentuate the, the, the taste of salt, that we, the little that we put. Let us also remember that we have salt in all the different things like maggi, nor cube, and all those cubes, they are full of sodium. So that's again another source of salt. Um, so if we if we reduce the amount of salt that we're eating right now, even in our soups, and then we put no extra salt on the table, that's very important. That's another way to make sure you keep your salt down. And it's Let's quickly take important. a call. Let's take a call from Port Harcourt. Um, hello? Sonny from Port Harcourt. I think we lost Sonny from Port Harcourt. Okay, doctor, let's continue and go into the tropical oils yes. you wanted to talk about. Yes. Okay. So um, I, I was talking about the tropical oils. And I think it's very interesting for us to know that the coconut oil and the palm oil, which is what is, uh, you know, indigenous to us, uh, has been... Um, flogged a bit in the media that they are not good. Uh, but here is, the, here is it. They, they raise both the good fat and the bad fat. That's the uh -huh. thing. They raise both. So here is my advice. Um, because we have certain foods that we cannot cook without the red oil, you know, and we all know that, um, like the dikainko and stuff and all lovely kinds of soup that we have. The, uh, the, 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 the advice will be cook with red oil but First of all, if red oil is uh, freshly squeezed by yourself, then you're sure that that is the healthy version. The commercially prepared ones are not as healthy. That's number one. But number two, to also reduce the amount of red oil that you put in your soups and to have it sparingly. So okay. you don't have it for every Let's day quickly take that you cook. But you Let me quickly jump in. Sorry about that. Lots of people are calling. Uh, let's take Mrs. Zachary from Lagos. Hello? Are you there, Mrs. Zachary? Yes, I'm here. What's your question? Yes, ma'am. I'm here. 
Go ahead. Ask Please, a question. Ma, I wanted to ask about this uh, hypertension. I had a hypertension for long. But as of now, when I take the VP, my VP, it used to be 131 or 137 over 60. Is it normal for me? Uh, how, how old are you, if you can tell us? I'm 75. All right, thank you very much. We move over to Dr. Monia and ask her, is that good for her at 75, 131 over 60? Okay. And she said she used to have okay. high blood pressure. What's going on? <laughs> okay. Um, I think I'm going to answer this in this way. First of all, this, this program is not supposed to take the place of your personal physician or your doctor. So it's going to be uh, not appropriate for me to say to you that value is good for you or not because I'm not your personal physician and also I don't have your full history. Um, please go back to your, your physician and let them have a look because quite often it's usually a trend uh, or, or the way your blood pressure has carried on for you know, months or years that help and everything else happening in your life that help us decide what is normal for you. Uh, whether or not you're doing that with some medications or without medications. And I think that it's always a good idea to go to see your physician who will continue to reemphasize uh, the healthy lifestyle advice. Uh, like WHO now wants us to target, you know, the HATS program, where the very first thing is healthy lifestyle counsel constantly. Um, so please go back to your doctor. Um, other things like, you know, uh, being able to uh, use... Um, protocols uh, that are based on evidence-based ba uh, uh, protocols, uh, being able to access medications, those are useful as well. Being able to manage hypertension based on your risks, that's also risk-based management, that's also useful. Having a team approach to managing hypertension uh, under a patient-centered care model, that's also useful. And of course, having systems uh, to look at monitoring systems, to look at how this is going on. And that's the HATS program by WHO to manage hypertension. However, the very first one, which is the Healthy Lifestyle Council, is to be done uh, by your clinicians. And please go back and back and back to them so that they make sure you're on track, somebody is coaching you through it, and making sure that you're doing that. So Thank my, you so much, Dr. Monye. Go to your doctor to sort that out. Thank you. Let me quickly ask a question that came on Twitter from Tupere Keyi. He's asking, eating eggs regularly, is it, does it cause hypertension? Is it bad? Yeah, okay. Seconds. Okay. Yeah. The egg question. Oh my goodness, this is a very, very, yes, this is a very, very topical one. Uh, and we have different schools of thought with the egg question, to be honest. Um, some schools of thought, will, and lots of research as well in this area, will say that have your egg, depending on your age anyway, the younger people, folks will have more, can tolerate more eggs than the older folks. The yellow of the eggs is where the cholesterol is. Um, however, weighed across balance. The advice for older people is reduce the amount of eggs you eat. Um, and aim to have, if you're an older uh, person, uh, aim to have one or two eggs a week. You shouldn't have more than that. But if you're okay, younger, Dr. Monye, you can have eggs every day. Thank you very much. We really, yes. really have to yeah, go well. now. That has been so interesting. Uh, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you, all our friends on Twitter and on the phone and those at home for calling in. Have a wonderful day. We've come to the end of the program. I am Mary Alale Yusuf.